The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Happy Thursday, everyone. I just have a few announcements before we get started. Today's presentation is hosted by HR Simple in partnership with Constangi. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box and we will get to them at the end of the webinar. If you need to view a recording of this webinar or would like to view other webinars, please go to hrsimple.com backslash events. The slides and recording will be sent to your inbox within 24 hours. HR Simple provides federal and state specific manuals. All of our books have been updated with new COVID-19 chapters, which include telecommuting policies and agreements, how to handle pandemics in the workplace, and the Families First Coronavirus Response Act poster. Today, you can use code COVIDWEBINAR30 for 30% off any purchase as a thank you for attending our webinar today. Now we're going to take a little time to learn about our speakers. Lori's primary focus of her law practice involves representing management in state and federal court employment litigation. Lori also represents employers in traditional labor law matters, including collective bargaining negotiations and grievance arbitrations. Lori devotes a significant portion of her practice to representing state and local governments in all aspects of labor and employment law. She has substantial experience working with government entities in reviewing policies and procedures and rules and regulations for public safety departments, conducting leave and wage and hour audits, negotiating collective bargaining agreements, providing training, and conducting workplace investigations. She has conducted workplace investigations in both union and non-unionized environments, including investigations into allegations of harassment, discrimination, bullying, and misconduct. Damon Kitchen has successfully defended cases in all areas of labor and employment law, including but not limited to claims of unlawful discrimination, sexual harassment, equal pay violations, employment-related freedom of speech, due process, and equal protection claims arising under both the federal and state constitutions. He also has experience in representing clients in traditional labor law matters, such as defending unfair labor practice charges, opposing union organizing campaigns, and serving as chief negotiator in collective bargaining negotiations. Damon is recognized in the publication Best Lawyers in America, as well as Florida Super Lawyers. I'm now going to hand things over to Lori so we can go ahead and start the presentation. Hello and welcome to the webinar on COVID-19 and public employers. I'm Lori Manns and both I and Damon Kitchen will be presenting to you today. We're both with the Jacksonville, Florida office of Constangi Brooks Smith and Profit. And as mentioned, both devote a significant portion of our practice to representing and advising government employers on labor and employment issues. And those are the employers for whom this presentation is designed. We realize that some of you on the webinar may be from private sector organizations, and that's certainly fine. While some of the material on which we present today will be applicable to both private sector and public sector employers, we do want to make sure you're aware that the focus of today's presentation will be on issues that are unique to government employers. We'll begin our presentation today with a brief introduction to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act or FFCRA. And we'll devote some time to aspects of that act that are really particular to government employers. Then we will discuss briefly the legal obligations of employers to provide a safe workplace. Then we'll turn our attention to the variety of constitutional issues with which government employers must deal and we'll examine how those issues can arise in the context of COVID-19. And Damon will be covering that part of the presentation. Next, we'll discuss the collective bargaining implications of COVID-19 related issues for those of you who are with government organizations that are unionized. And then finally, Damon will conclude the, pres conclude the presentation with a discussion of potential responses 
when employees uh, refuse to work due to concerns over COVID-19 or other COVID-19 related issues. Throughout the presentation, we will be speaking from the perspective of federal law and federal obligations or general trends. And we're happy um, to have attendees on this presentation from all over the country. So we do want to make sure you keep in mind that your state or locality may have one or more state or local laws that impact the topics that we're discussing today. So as most of you know by now, the FFCRA does apply to state and local government employers. It provides two types of leave, emergency paid sick leave and expanded FMLA leave. State and local governments are covered employers under both the emergency paid sick leave and the expanded FMLA leave provisions of the FFCRA, regardless of the size of their workforce. So this means that all sorts of state and local government entities are covered, including counties, municipalities, school districts, even utilities and other perhaps independent agencies of state governments and local governments as well. Uh, ultimately, the um, act may be revised or changed, but right now it's in effect through the end of the year. Um, and the requirements with respect to the paid sick leave, we focus first on that, are that covered employers provide up to 80 hours of pay at the employee's regular rate of pay if the employee is unable to work for one of the conditions listed on your side. And that's when the employee is quarantined because of a government order or advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine who are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and seeking medical diagnosis. The act requires up to 80 hours of paid sick leave at two thirds the employee's regular rate if they're unable to work because they need to care for someone who's subject to quarantine or to care for a child whose school or child care provider is not available due to COVID-19 related reasons. Do remember that this paid sick leave provision of the act is available to all full and part-time employees of a covered employer. It is, however, a one-time use entitlement. In other words, if the employee uses it with one employer, he or she isn't supposed to get it from a new or different employer. As a practical matter, we're not sure how that would, would come up or how that would be enforced, but that is the way the law reads. With respect to the expanded FMLA portion of the act, this provides um, that eligible employees get an additional 10 weeks of expanded leave at two thirds their regular rate of pay if they're unable to work because they have to care for a child whose child care provider or whose school is closed or unavailable for COVID-19 related reasons. Eligible employees for this portion of the act's leave are those who work for at least 30 calendar days prior to the date of the leave. This entitlement is 12 weeks in the aggregate. What do we mean by that? Well, if an employee has um, already taken traditional FMLA leave and would like to take leave under the expanded FMLA provisions of the act, it's a 12 week in aggregate entitlement. So any use of that traditional FMLA leave is going to cut into the employee's use or what may be available to the employee under the expanded FMLA leave. This is true even if the um, leave expands two different FMLA years. The Department of Labor in its correction notice to the temporary rule indicates that the 12 weeks of expanded leave is a max. And so, for example, if you are an employer who has a 12 month period beginning July 1, and an employee takes, um, took seven weeks of leave that was the expanded FMLA leave in May and June, the employee would only be eligible for five additional weeks of that expanded FMLA leave between July and December. And that's true even though the first seven weeks fell into a prior 12 month period. We have received several questions. Before we move on, I want to address, we have received several questions as we've advised local employ government employers on this about what it means for a school to be unavailable. And these questions have really arisen in the past 30 days or so as schools across the country begin to reopen in various forms. To the best of our knowledge, there's no guidance specifically addressing this issue, 
but we believe if a brick and mortar option to school is available and a parent or employee nevertheless chooses an online or virtual option and chooses not to send their, their child to the brick and mortar option, that does not mean that the school is unavailable or that the child care is unavailable for purposes of the act. In other words, if brick and mortar is available and the parent chooses not to take advantage of the brick and mortar, we do not believe they're eligible for leave under that provision of the act. So I wanna talk now about a provision of the act that does come up in particular with respect to public employers. And we could easily devote our entire presentation really to a discussion of the nuances of the act. But I wanna speak specifically about this provision of the act that deals with emergency responders. The act allows employers to exclude certain employees from both the paid sick leave and expanded family leave provisions. Those employees are healthcare providers and emergency responders. And it's the second category of emergency responders that we found government employers in particular are dealing with. The act defines emergency responders very broadly as anyone necessary for the provision of transport, care, healthcare, comfort and nutrition of patients or others needed for the response of COVID-19. And that definition is in your materials in the second bullet point. You can see in particular, if you look at the last part of that definition where it refers to quote, others needed for the response to COVID-19, how broadly this could be interpreted. And there are some examples that pretty clearly fall within this definition of emergency responder and are probably the ones that come to mind first, like law enforcement personnel, fire rescue personnel, personnel of correctional institutions, but also some perhaps um, less common examples of an emergency responder that could meet the definition are those who work in public works or others who might be needed to respond to COVID-19 related issues. So for example, public works personnel and persons with skills or training to operate, operate specialized equipment that might be needed to provide aid in a declared emergency can qualify. So this could, this could for example, include employees who are needed to install or maintain uh, physical barriers that help limit the spread of COVID-19 or employees who are um, necessary in order to make PPE available or make sure the provision of PPE is available to all employees to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Those are types of other personnel that could qualify for this definition. There's also kind of a catch-all in the act that explains emergency responders can also include any individual who the highest, whom the highest official of a state determines is an emergency responder necessary for that state's response to COVID-19. The Department of Labor has made it known that this exclusion with respect to emergency responders should be applied judiciously to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Now, there have been some members of Congress that have complained that the exception is too broad and, and undermines the purpose of the act, but regardless, the Department of Labor has taken the position that there should be some flexibility allowed to employers to determine who is an emergency responder and thus who can be excluded from the leave provisions of the act. So this raises several questions. First, can an employer exclude emergency responders from leave to care for a family member with COVID-19, but provide them with such leave if it's because of their own illness with COVID-19? And with respect to that question, we believe the answer is yes. The employer may decide to um, treat emergency responders differently with depending on the reason for the need for leave. The second question that may come up is can an employer decide which employee is in fact an emergency responder for purposes of not giving them the leave under the act on a case by case basis. And we believe the answer to that is also yes. And in fact, that might be the best way to do it, particularly given the fluidity of the situation 
you may decide that depending on the numbers in your community or the needs at any given time, you want the flexibility to determine who's going to be excluded from leave based on the emergency responder definition on a case by case basis. Another question that may arise is, should you as an employer develop a written policy to go ahead and list or identify which personnel or which job titles fall within the category of emergency responders? Or stated another way, should you have a policy that identifies who's not going to be given this leave based on the emergency responder definition? And there's nothing that says that you can't develop such a policy. But with respect to this third question, we think this may not be the way to go. Um, you might, for example, want to develop an internal uh, policy that identifies who may meet the definition of an emergency responder. But we don't recommend that you prepare a limiting policy because the situation may change uh, day to day and is probably best viewed on a case-by-case -case basis. I do want to mention, before we move on to some practical and policy considerations, I do want to mention the Southern District of New York case, which some of you may be familiar with because it has received a lot of attention in the media. For those of you who aren't familiar, the decision was a decision was issued by the Southern District of New York, a federal court in New York on, on August, excuse me, August 3rd of this year. And it was in a case brought against the Department of Labor by the state of New York under the Administrative Procedure Act. In a nutshell, the court in that case did strike down several provisions of, of the act and took issue with the um, Department of Labor's regulations interpreting the act. It struck down the work availability requirements. In other words, you may be aware that under current DOL guidance and regulations, if the reason that an employee is not working is due to the lack of work by the employer because of a slowdown, for example, then generally speaking, the employee is not going to be entitled to leave under the act. The Southern District struck down those those provisions. The Southern District also struck down the what, what it viewed as a broad definition of healthcare provider. It also struck down requ the requirement that an employer consent to um, intermittent leave in certain situations. And finally, it struck down the requirement that um, documentation be provided as a precondition to leave. So that's a very brief summary of the court's opinion. What I do want to mention is it didn't impact the emergency responder analysis that we've discussed, and it doesn't apply to employers outside the Southern District of New York. So speaking of those policy considerations, there's no legal requirement that you develop a written, uh, written COVID-19 policy. There is a posting requirement, and so you should um, you should be complying with the posting requirement. You can do that by downloading the Department of Labor poster, which is available on its website. We do, however, recommend that you prepare some sort of written policy memo or, or guidance on the way that you're going to handle um, COVID-19 in the workplace so that employees know what to expect and who to contact with questions, and that policy should certainly uh, explain and outline how you're going to handle leave requests under the FCRA. And for example, you would want your policy to explain what documentation, if any, would be required in order to support the leave requests. The regulations do specify what documentation can be requested and, and what documentation must be maintained by the employer. You'll want to um, outline who those leave requests should be sent to and determine who's going to be in charge of reviewing and approving them, and also consider who's going to track usage and whether that will be the same or a different person who tracks your employee's FMLA usage. Again, we don't recommend identifying in your policy an exhaustive list of those who are going to be excluded based on the emergency responder definition, but we do recommend you give some thought to who may be in those categories and perhaps 
give some thought to some criteria that will guide your decision if you're going to make those decisions on a case by case basis. What criteria are you going to use to determine uh, whether and when you're going to rely upon that emergency responder exception? We have seen with respect to the last bullet point on this slide, we have seen several public employers we work with receive public records requests. Sometimes it's for um, policy documents, but often it's been for um, data on employee leave usage or employee leave requests. Whether from union organizations or media outlets making these requests, you'll want to check your state laws on this point, but generally speaking, much of this documentation is going to be exempt from public records requirements, so keep that in mind. One other consideration with respect to your policy and the drafting of that policy, or from a process standpoint, how you will handle leave requests. We've received several questions from clients who are wondering whether they can prohibit employees from traveling to a restricted area and then returning from that area and being subject to a quarantine as a result. In other words, uh, there is a feeling among some employers, some of our clients, that employees are taking advantage of the leave provisions of the act by traveling to an area they know is going to require a quarantine when they return, and that will then make them um, eligible for paid leave under the act. Um, we, we are concerned about prohibiting that type of travel because we are concerned it could be viewed as retaliatory and the FSCRA does prohibit retaliation against an employee for exercising or attempting to um, exercise our right to take leave under the act. So just keep in mind that, that there could be some concerns if you want to prohibit employees from traveling to um, a restricted area that would trigger a quarantine upon return. The Federal Occupational Safety and Health Act, or OSHA, generally does not apply to you all as government employers, but there are several states, and you may be in a state that, that falls within this category, there are several states that have OSHA plans that do apply to public sector employers, and so you'll want to be aware of whether you're in one of those states and what, if any, obligations you need to be meeting to provide a safe workplace as it relates to COVID-19 and exposure to your employees. There is a lot of discussion right now about whether and the extent to which employees who can firmly say that the reason they contracted the virus is based upon you know, their job and what they've done at work um, and whether that would be covered by state workers compensation insurance. We don't really know the answer to those sort of legal theories. Regardless. And regardless of whether you're in a state that does have an OSHA plan that applies to government employers. There is a general duty on the part of employers from a tort standpoint to provide employees with a safe workplace. And so we do recommend that you take into account government guidance, whether it's CDC, OSHA, or your State Department of Health guidance on um, prevention and mitigation measures in the workplace. Those include social distancing, the use of mass symptom checks, uh, contact tracing, and, and extra cleaning and um, sanitizing efforts. I'm now gonna turn it over to Damon to talk about some of the constitutional issues surrounding this. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, constitutional issues uh, are, 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 are a problem that public sector employers have to deal with that uh, you individuals who are on the private sector that may be participating in this webinar don't have to worry about. It's an additional concern that the public sector employers have. Now, constitutional issues can arise from two basic sources. Uh, the United States Constitution, uh, for sure, but a lot of people forget about their individual state constitutions. State constitutions can create constitutional issues as well. And it's important to note that state constitutions frequently contain protections and requirements that you won't find in the federal constitution. In other words, state constitutions are often more broad than the United States Constitution and therefore can give rise to certain constitutional claims. So whenever you're, whenever you're considering, well, are there potential constitutional issues at play, 
you know, don't forget about the fact that you may be in a state that also has additional constitutional uh, protections that are beyond what is covered in the federal constitution. Um, now, as Lori said at the outset, uh, because we're here in Florida and we're not really sure where, what state you might be in, we're talking today, uh, you know, in discussing, generally speaking, federal constitutional issues. That having been said, please be aware that, uh, you know, in your particular state, you may also have companion state constitutional issues that you, you have to be concerned about. Um, and these constitutional issues, whether they're state or federal, arise in three basic areas. Uh, the right to privacy, the right to due process, and the right to what we call free expression. Uh, Laura, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the constitutional right of privacy. Well, on a federal level, the right of privacy is guaranteed under the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment basically states, as the slide says, that people have the right to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. If you look at the slide, we've un underlined the word persons and, un and, and unreasonable. Because when we're talking about privacy investigations, we'll talk about this in a minute, that are COVID specific. Sometimes we're talking about invasions of privacy. We're not talking about going through somebody's desk. We're talking about requiring them to do something which invades their body. Uh, and we're also talking about uh, searches and seizures. It's important to re realize that not all searches and seizures are unlawful. Only unreasonable searches and seizures are unlawful. So when a public employer requires employees to provide personal sensitive information, submit to medical testing, or comport to specific rules and requirements while off duty, they can expect to encounter invasion of privacy claims, which are cognizable under the Fourth Amendment. Laura, if you'd advance the slide, please. Well, let's talk about reasonable expectations of privacy. The common denominator in any Fourth Amendment uh, invasion of privacy claim is whether or not the individual employee has a subjective expectation of privacy that is deemed objectively reasonable. Well, that, what does that mean? Well, does the individual employee truly believe that what the employer is asking him to do uh, might be an invasion of his or her privacy? If the answer to that is yes, we then have to ask, what would an, a reasonable person in that employee's situation think? Would a reasonable person think, well, yes, I agree, that's, a, that's an invasion of my privacy, versus just what this particular individual thinks? So it's both a subjective expectation as well as a, you know, we have to then take that person's subjective expectation and then ask ourselves, well, what would a reasonable person, as opposed to this particular person, think? And this could come in up in the context of an employer requiring somebody to do something that's private in nature, or it could also be requiring somebody to do something while they're off duty. Um, so the question then becomes, well, what does that employee think? Is it reasonable to him or her? And then what would, would the general public think? Laura, if you advance the next slide. So what are some invasion of privacy claims related to COVID-19 that we're seeing and that you can anticipate? Well, first, uh, Lori, can you, can you, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, I apologize. So what is the Fourth Amendment, so, so what's the situation? If an employee determines, says, I believe this is an invasion of my privacy, and the, an objective person would say, yes, that's, that's, that's uh, also an invasion of privacy. Well, then generally speaking, Fourth Amendment protection is going to be deemed to exist. But does that mean that the employer cannot conduct a search or seizure? Or you know, maybe it's requiring somebody to take a temperature or make them do something while they're off duty. Well, the answer is no. The, the, the question is going to be whether or not that, that, uh, that search or seizure is unreasonable. And we're going to have to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis. So, Lori, if you advance to the next slide that I had previously started discussing, what are some invasion of privacy claims related to COVID-19 that we're seeing and you can anticipate? Well, 
First of all, can employer require employees to submit to temperature checks at work? We got a ton of these questions when, when, uh, when the FFCRA came out and, and, and people were under orders to, to social distance. Uh, and, and then when, when things started to open up, at least in Florida, and people are coming back to work, what can employers require employees to do? And the answer to that question is, you know, the answer is generally yes. Uh, public employers can require their employees to submit the temperature checks as a condition of returning to work or continuing to work in the public. However, it's important to note that in doing so, we encourage public employers to use the least intrusive means of performing temperature checks that's available. Uh, we have in our office, and I'm sure many of you do as well, infrared thermometers. You don't have to touch the person at all. You can stand from a distance and take their temperature. And that's much less intrusive than say requiring somebody to, to stick a thermometer in their mouth or heaven forbid some other part of their body. So always look for the least intrusive method. And if you go to the next slide. Now, another question we get, and it's not a, not, it's not a constitutional question, but it's a question we get a lot and it's one I think you'll get is, are temperature checks medical examinations for the purposes of the Americans with Disabilities Act? And the answer is yes. But does that mean you can't take somebody's temperature? Although a temperature check is a medical examination, the Americans with Disabilities says medical examinations are permissible under the Americans with Disabilities Act if they're job related and consistent with business necessity. And if the purpose of us to taking somebody's temperature is to ascertain whether or not they may have some type of virus or communicable disease, then that's job related and, and consistent with business necessity. And in fact, the EEOC in recent months has come out with a guidance uh, specifically stating that. So it's okay to take temperature checks. It's, it's, uh, as long as we, we do it reasonably and non-intrusively, it doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment, it doesn't violate the ADA. If you go to the next slide, please. Well, another question we get is, can public employers uh, ask employees about whether they've been exposed to people who have COVID-19 and or whether or not they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. Again, you know, some employees believe that's an invasion of their privacy to ask them that. Well, is it an invasion of privacy? Well, no, you're allowed to do that. Once again, if an employee is working or seeking to return to work in a workplace that is open to the public or in close proximity with other employees, the answer to this question is, if it's necessary to protect the health and safety of others, employers can ask somebody if they've been exposed to COVID-19 uh, or people who have COVID-19 or if they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. These are okay questions to ask. And if you go to the next slide, Lori. Now, just because you ask that question doesn't and get an answer to it, doesn't mean you can broadcast the information you get to anybody in the workplace. One of the things that's just natural, and Lori and I have seen it in the workplace since our office, is reopened is you know, employees are concerned and they ask questions. Somebody doesn't come in for work or they hear an employee sick. They may ask you, you know, does, does Bob have COVID-19 or has Bob been exposed to COVID-19? You can ask Bob these questions, but you've got an obligation to treat that information once it's acquired as being highly sensitive. You can't turn around and tell somebody without potential legal repercussions that somebody has tested positive for COVID-19 or somebody is not coming into work today because they, they've got symptoms of COVID-19 and are going to be tested. You know, that, that information should only be disclosed and shared with individuals in the workplace that have a legitimate need to have that information. And who might that be? Well, the employee's immediate supervisor, for example. But in every situation, you have to evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. There's gonna be no bright line answer to who the person is that has a legitimate need to have information. So if you're in doubt, you know, that's maybe a good time to contact your labor and employment attorney and get some guidance. Or if you turn to the next slide. Another question that we've been getting a lot of is can public employers require employees to socially distance 
and or observe COVID-19 related safe practices while off duty. Hopefully, uh, in your workplace, you're asking people if you don't have a written policy, you're at least having certain protocols and safe practices that you're requiring your, of your employees. But what about employees who are off duty? Um, you know, you can do your best to protect your workplace while the employees are working from within your office. But if after hours they're going out, you know, and, and, and going to concerts where people are not appropriately socially distancing or going to nightclubs or football games or whatever it may be, uh, and they're not observing the same safe practices you require them to do so from the workplace, you know, there's a potential for exposure. So can, can public employers require employees to social distance or observe other safe safety protocols while off duty? <laughs> the answer, the best answer we can give you is it really depends. Uh, if the public employee's off-duty conduct creates hazards, problems, or disruptions from the employer, and the employee's privacy interest in that situation can be subordinated by the public employer's greater need to maintain a safe and healthy workplace. So a lot of times there's there's not just not going to be a bright line answer to these questions, but this is one where you're really going to have to say, okay, I need to look at this on a case by case basis. What is the type of public employee? You know, what what type of risk does he or she pose? You know, and where what is the 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 situation created by the off-duty conduct that would would require the public uh, employer to mandate that this employee must observe safety and health protocols outside of the workplace. And if we can come up with a legitimate business reason, then it's defensible. Now, a third thing to be aware of, because I realize some of you people are in different states, you need to look at state law, because although in Florida, Florida is very employer friendly, and there isn't a state law that specifically provides uh, protection to employees who seek to intrude into their personal lives while off duty, other states have laws which very specifically govern what employers can and cannot do with respect to employees while they're off duty. So always be aware of what your state law is before you pull the trigger with respect to off-duty conduct. Okay, if you would do the next slide, Lori. I want to talk a little bit now, let's pivot into talking to another constitutional issue, and that's due process or the due process requirements. Now, due process under the federal constitution can arise from two different amendments. Uh, uh, due process protection from the federal government is in the fifth amendment, but since most people on this call are gonna be state or local employees, we're really talking about due process protections that emanate from the 14th amendment. And the 14th amendment states that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Well. What does that mean? Well, some public employees, but not all of them, have what we call a property interest in their job. And a property interest is a constitutional due process interest that protects these employees in positions in employment. And it basically means that employees cannot be disciplined or terminated from employment without cause. Or sometimes it's referred to as good cause or even just cause. Cause, good cause, just cause, they're all interchangeable. Now, in addition to that, due process means that employees cannot be disciplined and terminated from employment without reasonable notice and an opportunity to be heard. Now, we put those terms in, in quotations because we're going to talk about what reasonable notice and an opportunity to be heard is in a minute. But for now, I want to talk about where does this due process property interest come from? What creates a property interest? Well, there are different things that create a property interest. Remember those state constitutional provisions? Uh, state constitution that I was talking about? State constitutions have, sometimes have due process protections in there for public employees. Uh, local uh, charters could have a due process protection built in. Statutes and ordinances can have uh, due process protections. Uh, in the absence of uh, a constitution, statute, or ordinance, uh, an employment contract could have a provision stating that an employee can only be disciplined or 
terminated for cause. So we sometimes see that in a, a public sector employment contracts. Where we typically see it is in collective bargaining agreements, which is a type of employment contract, but it's, a, it's, it's an employment contract involving multiple people who are represented by a union. But it's, I don't, can't ever remember in 30 years of practicing ever seeing a collective bargaining agreement that didn't say that employees could not be disciplined or terminated uh, uh, without cause. You'll always find cause language in a collective bargaining agreement. So let's talk a little bit about what cause, good cause or just cause means. Uh, what, how do we determine what that means? Well, I would suggest first, look at the statute ordinance contractual agreement to see if there's a built in definition. For example, in, in Florida, we have what we call state career service employees. And there's a statute dealing with them. It's chapter 110.227 Florida statutes. And that statute defines cause, and I quote, as including but not limited to poor performance, negligence, inefficiency, or inability to perform assigned duties, insubordination, uh, violations of provisions of laws or agency rules, conduct in becoming a public employee, misconduct, habitual drug use, or conviction of any crime. So there's a definition of cause. And if you want to discipline or terminate somebody, it better be for one of those reasons listed if you're dealing with a career service employee in Florida. Otherwise, if you're, you're, if you're disciplining that person for, for something other than that, you're disciplining that person for a reason that doesn't amount to cause, which would be problematic. Well, what if there's not a, a definition in a statute or a contract. Well, sometimes because of case precedent, we can say in these situations, this person is considered to have a property interest in his or her job. Now, bear in mind, some public employees don't have a property interest in their job. They don't have a contract or there isn't some statute saying that they can only be disciplined for cause or good cause. We call these employees at will employees. And that's what most people in the private sector are. They're at will employees. And what does that mean? It means they don't have a property interest in their job. And as the, the, the old saying goes in Florida under the law, good reason, bad reason, no reason at all, that person can be disciplined or terminated from employment as long as that reason is not illegal. But many public sector employers, excuse me, employees have a uh, property interests in their job. So it's always important to look at that. Lori, if you would go to the next slide. Well, assuming we've got somebody who has a property interest in their job, what kind of notice is required? Well, remember we put it in parentheses. It's they must receive reasonable notice of disciplinary action to be taken against them and the factual basis for such disciplinary action. Well, what is reasonable notice? Well, again, big surprise. There's no bright line test here. Generally speaking, seven to 10 calendar days is typically going to be considered by most courts to be reasonable notice. Uh, one thing a lot of public sector employers do, and I think it's good to do this, if there's an intention to take disciplinary action, that the public employer issue the employee what I refer to as an intent to discipline or terminate letter. And that letter sets forth the grounds for why disciplinary action is going to be taken uh, and, and the specific reason which would amount to cause under whatever statute or collective bargaining agreement or other provision that exists, you're going to be terminated because you were showed up to work drunk in violation of this provision of, of our handbook, which conduct you know, constitutes misconduct or illegal drug use, whatever. And then states that the individual is going to be given a reasonable opportunity to be heard. Uh, oftentimes we call these letters predetermination letters. And that gets to the other piece of due process. Well, first of all, the predetermination letter needs to notify them and then give them an opportunity to be heard. But you can't say, here's your letter in 20 minutes, we're gonna have a predetermination conference. You've gotta give them a reasonable opportunity to be heard 
and sufficient notice so that they can prepare to 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 rebut the claims against them. And and in these situations, we recommend holding a predetermination conference, which should be identified in your intent to discipline or terminate letter, saying that on this date, if you want to have one, you can elect to have a predetermination conference where you'll be given an opportunity to rebut the claims against you. Well, what type of a uh, reasonable what type of opportunity does somebody have to be given? Well, the statute doesn't say that they have to be given the right to have counsel present. Uh, it doesn't say that they have the right to ask the, the employer any questions. The employee just has to be given an opportunity to refute the charges against him or her. Uh, typically speaking, we, we recommend allowing someone to have a representative at a predetermination conference or they want it to be a lawyer, or maybe it's uh, another worker. But what we, we, we recommend is these individuals are told that this is just an opportunity for the employee to address the charges brought against him or her. It's not an opportunity for the, the, uh, the employee or the employee's attorney or representative to pose questions to the employer. It's their opportunity to rebut the claims that are brought against them. That's it. Uh, now, key thing to remember here is if we don't provide somebody with reasonable notice and an opportunity to be heard, then we've got a procedural due process problem. So again, we, we recommend that with, with respect to your intent to terminate letter, we give them the opportunity to elect a predetermination conference and we set that sufficiently far out such that they will have an opportunity to prepare for that predetermination conference. Well, let's talk about a third area where employers get into trouble and could get into trouble with COVID-19, and that's freedom of expression. Now, in this day and age, I would be surprised if some of you have not received complaints about your COVID-19 policies and practices. And, you know, in the private sector, you can deal with these individuals much more freely than you can in the public sector, but it's important to remember that sometimes when employees complain about their workplace policies and practices, uh, this can be, although frustrating for you as a public employer, it can be protected either by the First Amendment or perhaps under some state labor law. So, for example, an employee say, saying, I think requiring me to return to the office is crazy or stupid. You know, somebody sends an email out to you as the employer or maybe out to his coworker. You know, you're probably not going to like that, but guess what? There's certain employee protections at issue that we need to think about before we, we, we respond. The first is First Amendment free speech protection, and the second is protection under state labor laws. If we go to the next slide, Lori. Let's talk a little bit about the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects employees who speak out about matters of public concern. Well, what does that protect him from? The First Amendment protects him from governmental retaliation. Now, remember, the key thing is speaking out of, as, about matters of a public concern. And it's important to note here, they don't speak out as employees. They have to speak out as citizens regarding a matter of public concern. Notably, speech made by an employee regarding matters related to the performance of a public employee's job is not considered protected speech under the First Amendment. The employee has to be speaking out as a citizen regarding a matter of public concern. And again, we put citizen in, uh, in, in, in quotes, in public concern in quotes, because these are key words in terms of art from a legal perspective. Now, the contours of what constitutes a public concern or when somebody's speaking out as a citizen are not always well defined. For example, let's say we have one of these county EMTs and he's not happy about something. Let's say he's unhappy uh, uh, and complaining in the workplace about having to wear a face mask in people's homes as per his employer safety policy. Well, in that situation, is he or she speaking out on a matter uh, of public concern? regarding, uh, you know, it, it, as a citizen? Or is he talking out about a matter 
of a more personal concern regarding things involving his job. In that situation, I would argue this is this he's talking as an employee, not as a citizen regarding a matter of public concern. He's talking about something that affects him as a public employee personally. But the same employee, and suppose this time, he's not complaining about anything related to his job as an EMT, but he's complaining about the school district's decision to reopen public schools in a brick and mortar fashion in view of COVID-19. Well, what about that situation? In that situation, it's hard to argue that he's talking about something that is employment related, He's an EMT. He doesn't work in the, for the school district. And he's not talking about something that necessarily is impacting just him personally. He's talking about a matter of public concern. So in that situation, there might be some First Amendment protection uh, there. Okay. Now, finally, speech even made as a citizen on a matter of public concern, although entitled to First Amendment protection, can still be subordinated by a public employer's need to prevent workplace disruption and ensure the efficient provision of services to the public. So, and this comes up where somebody might be saying something, but then what we looked at was what you may have heard this before, we call what time, place, and manner restriction. This person is speaking out as a citizen as a public concern, but is the, are, is the way they're doing it, the time they're doing it, and the, in the particular circumstance, in which they're doing it unduly disruptive to the public employer if the public employer can make an argument that even though they're speaking out as a citizen of, uh, on a matter of public concern the the time place and manner of them speaking out creates a disruption then 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 in that situation uh more likely than not the courts are going to determine that the employer has a right to regulate that speech well, in addition to First Amendment protections, we also need to be concerned about what we call protected concerted activity. Lori, if you go to the next slide. Public employees need to be aware that most, if not all states, have laws that protect the rights of employees to engage in what we call protected concerted activity. In Florida, we have a statute called the Public Employees Relations Act, or PARA, and it's modeled after the Federal National Labor Relations Act, which applies to private sectors. And basically what this says is employees have a right to engage in protected concerted activity uh, to, to discuss or complain about uh, wages, terms, uh, wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment. So Typically, when we're talking about protected concerted activity, we're talking about a communication between at least two or more employees. But be aware, sometimes an employee will, will take the, the posture of what we might call a whistleblower and claim that he or she is speaking out on behalf of other employees or too afraid to come forward. There have been some cases where courts have said, well, in that situation, even though there's only one person involved, that person is engaging in protected concerted activity. Just bear in mind, employees complaining about a public employer's COVID-19 policies and procedures most likely constitutes protected concerted activity, regardless of whether employees belong to a union or not. Because that's what we get a lot of times. We get it's like, well, why should I worry about protected concerted activity? My employees are not unionized. Well, believe it or not, uh, the the laws in these state laws and certainly in the national labor relations act protect individuals in both unionized and non-unionized workplaces so it might be less likely that you'll get a, a, a an unfair labor practice charge uh, as a result of an employee claiming he or she, she was muzzled for engaging in protected activity uh, it's still a possibility and at this point i kind of want to shift to Lori, who will talk a little bit more about collective bargaining consideration. So speaking of protected concerted activity regarding wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment, for those of you in organizations with unionized workforces, um, all of these are, are presenting some challenges vis-a-vis COVID-19. Uh, and, and there are certainly bargaining implications that you all have to be mindful of. 
first from a process standpoint, if your state requires, like Florida does, that negotiations be conducted in compliance with um, government in the sunshine or public meeting laws, like, like is the case here in Florida, you'll want to consider whether or not you're able to conduct bargaining in person or whether because of state or local stay home orders or other um, considerations that make in-person bargaining undesirable, remote bargaining is an option. And if so, the extent to which it is an option. We know, for example, several state and local government employers with whom we've worked have conducted collective bargaining negotiations via conference calls with an open conference line. Um, and then that conference call number is placed on the public meeting notice advising the public of the, um, the scheduling of the collective bargaining meeting. So there are other ways you can, you can meet those. Um, there might be other ways you can meet those government in the sunshine or public meeting requirements without doing in-person bargaining. From a substantive standpoint, COVID-19 has and will continue to impact bargaining subjects in various ways. And that's true with respect to issues that employers may be able to uh, deal with as management rights, decisions that we may be able to make as management rights, uh, as well as issues that are mandatory subjects of bargaining, either by statute or because uh, of the way that they are addressed in the collective bargaining agreement. So I wanna talk just a little bit about the most frequent ways in which we've seen COVID-19 come up in the case of collective bargaining issues. First, we've seen this come up already in terms of minimum staffing requirements. Oftentimes collective bargaining agreements have minimum staffing requirements. Sometimes it can be a management right, but often they're in collective bargaining agreements. and. COVID-19 quarantines due to exposures and isolation orders, et cetera, um, as well as uh, leave requirements necessitated by the FFCRA, have we've seen an impact employers' ability to comply with minimum staffing requirements and sometimes even requires um, those sorts of issues have required more mandatory overtime. So you'll want to make sure you uh, have a good grasp on what, if any, minimum staffing or overtime obligations you have to follow as a result of statutory or collective bargaining language. We've also seen a lot of union activity, uh, and frankly, in both private and public sector uh, environments with respect to hazard pay and requests for hazard pay, particularly with our fire rescue EMS employees and also uh, law enforcement employees. So you'll want to be mindful of that and whether there are any bargaining obligations with respect to hazard pay. And then we've seen employers who, because of concerns regarding funding, have uh, needed to renegotiate pay provisions that are already in collective bargaining agreements. For example, some collective bargaining agreements have built in automatic pay increases if it's like a multi-year agreement. And we've seen employers concerned with being able to fund those automatic pay increases um, given the current situation. Leave is another area where COVID-19 has come up and that may uh, give rise to bargaining considerations. And although compliance with the FFCRA is mandatory, it's not an optional thing, there are some aspects of it that can be subject to negotiation. Um, for example, what we one, one example is something we talked about earlier, and that is um, whether and when an employer may rely upon the emergency responder exception to deny an employee leave. Is that something that we are required to bargain? Uh, perhaps. And so if that's something that comes up and you're in a unionized environment, you want to be mindful of that. In addition, certainly safety and health protocols, uh, we've seen that come up routinely with unions um, who are concerned about returning to the workplace and what steps the employer is going to take to ensure the safe uh, return of employees in the workplace. So uh, all that is typically going to be subject to bargaining, PPE requirements, um, cleaning protocols, all of those things will likely be subject to bargaining. And remember that even if the decision at hand is a management right, often it will uh, result in the exercise of that management right, right will result in uh, an impact bargaining requirement if it impacts 
wages, hours, or terms and conditions of employment. So all of this raises several questions. I just want to touch on a few common ones. Um, if a provision of the collective bargaining agreement needs to be changed because of something unexpected that's come up due to COVID-19 and its impact, and um, there's no ability, first we would want to look to see whether or not the agreement could be suspended. And so we would look at provisions like declaration of emergency provisions or force majeure provisions of the collective bargaining agreement to see if either of those types of provisions would allow the agreement to be suspended. Sometimes it may not allow suspension, it may allow um, some sort of change to certain provisions, et cetera, but those are provisions you'll want to look to. If there's not an option that allows for the suspension of the agreement, you may also want to look at provisions of the agreement that speak to the duration of the agreement or the ability to reopen or renegotiate the agreement prior to a traditional reopener period. That could be addressed in the collective bargaining agreement. It could be addressed in a management rights provision. Or if you're looking to do some sort of midterm bargaining and your collective bargaining agreement doesn't address it, there could be a statutory provision that allows you to reopen the, co the contract for purposes of bargaining. For example, in Florida, there are certain um, theories upon which an employer can require um, exceptions to the bargaining process, and those are like exigent circumstances or financial urgencies. Uh, and so you would want to make sure you're aware of what, if any, statutory provisions may allow you to midterm open up and renegotiate a contract. And we always recommend that you, you very carefully consider those duration and reopener provisions when you have the opportunity to do so, particularly right now. And to the extent possible, you build in some flexibility in those duration and reopener provisions of your collective bargaining agreement. Um, particularly if you don't have a force majeure or emergency provision in your CBA already that allows it to be suspended or renegotiated midterm um, in certain situations, because you're, you're probably going to need some flexibility to deal with the uncertainties uh, and of the current environment and a traditional CBA that only allows a reopener at certain periods of time um, may not allow you to deal with those uncertainties adequately. And Damon's now gonna talk about what uh, happens when an employee refuses to come to work due to COVID-19 related concerns. Now this is something we're seeing a lot of now. And we're seeing a lot of this in Florida with respect to public school teachers now that uh, schools are reopening. Uh, but what can employers do when an employer refuses to work due to a COVID-19 matter? Uh, I think you need to ask a series of questions. And, and Lori and I kind of have developed a checklist. Uh, first of all, what is the reason for the employee refusing to return to work? Is the employee refusing to return to work at the employer's workplace? Uh, is it a situation where they, they, they want to telework or work from home or some other location. Uh, and then, or, or is it a situation where somebody is, is refusing uh, to return to work because they don't like the, the, the workplace COVID-19 protocols? They're refusing to wear a mask, for example. Now note, when it comes to like masks and other types of personal protective equipment, state and local laws may require this. In Florida, for example, uh, you know, the governor and the mayor ha have issued uh, directives and executive orders requiring uh, individuals to wear masks in public. So, you know, you know, there may be, you know, a basis for defending your 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 workplace policies and practices depending on what the nature of the refusal is. Now, one question we always want to ask if it involves uh, uh, returning to the office, is the position one in which the employee is capable of teleworking? In other words, working remotely from another location. Some jobs, you just can't do that. Just not possible. For example, um, I don't know, somebody who works a drive through window, whether at a bank or at a, at a, at a McDonald's, for example. Uh, 
there's no way to do that from home. Uh, so, you know, that person can't telework. Uh, is the employee eligible for emergency paid sick leave or emergency FMLA under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act? Uh, if not, is the employee otherwise eligible for traditional FMLA leave? Uh, if the answer to that is yes, then ask yourself, does this employee have a serious health condition as defined uh, by the FMLA such that if, they, if, if they've exhausted uh, their emergency paid sick leave and they're not eligible for expanded FMLA, maybe we can give them leave under their FMLA. Uh, another question to ask is, does the employee have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or major life activities for the purposes of the ADA? Are we dealing with somebody who has a disability? Uh, you know, that's important to know. Um, now, if so, maybe we need to engage in what we call the interactive process to determine if there's some reasonable accommodation that may exist to allow this person to perform what we call the essential functions of his or her job. Well, what if none of these things apply? What if the employee says, look, I'm not sick, I'm not disabled. I'm just scared. I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe coming into work because I think if I come into work, I'm going to get the coronavirus. Well, in that situation, you know, that employee is not going to be covered by the FFCRA, not going to be covered by the FMLA, not going to be covered by the ADA. So what are our options here? Well, we try to work with this employee, try to convince them that it's necessary for that in person to come back to work. We also, even though it's not covered by the ADA, could explore the possibility of providing them some accommodation, such as teleworking, which would allow them to do the job, assuming the job can be done from home. But if the job can't be done from home, and they're not otherwise protected by some state or federal law, then maybe the next thing to do is we've got to consider discipline. And sometimes, you know, people have to be disciplined and sometimes even terminated. Now, you know, if an individual has a disability and is unable to return to work uh, because they can't perform the essential functions of his job, or for that matter, any other position, and we've explored through the interactive process, you know, ways to get this person uh, to possibly be able to do the job, either from the workplace or remotely, and there's no reasonable accommodation what do we do? Well, in that situation, you know, termination may need to be an option, but we need to document that very carefully we've explored, you know, every possible option to reasonably accommodate and that be very clear that we're not terminating this person for disciplinary reasons. We're terminating this employee because there's no way to reasonably accommodate him or her and because they can't be accommodated they can't perform the essential functions of their job. And under the ADA, the only individuals who are protected are qualified individuals with disabilities. That means only people who can perform the essential functions of their job, either with or without a reasonable accommodation are protected. Qualified individual has to be able to perform the essential functions of his or her job with or without a reasonable accommodation. If they can't do that, then they're not a qualified individual with a disability and they're not protected. Now, sometimes disciplinary action up to and including termination of employment may be required of employees who refuse to return to work uh, or return to work from uh, a brick and mortar office setting due to COVID-19 rela re related reasons. In such instances, it's really important as we discussed before to determine if these individuals have property interests in their job. And if so, we need to determine if there's a good cause basis to take this reaction against them. Now, at this point, uh, I think you know, we've concluded our presentation, so we'll address any questions you may have sent us in the remaining five minutes that we have for our presentation. So if you have any questions that you haven't already emailed us, please go ahead and do that at this time. So I'll go ahead and take uh, um, some of the, the first questions, first few questions that we've received. Uh, I think the first couple of questions pertain to teleworking. And um, one concern is if we provide telework 
that option to employees in response to COVID-19, are we setting a precedent for the future when an employee seeks that option as an accommodation under the ADA? And think this is a great question. Um, I think it's, I, I don't know that I would call it a precedent, but it's certainly something that you have to think about. I think one of the things that this situation has shown many employers is that teleworking is a viable option for, uh, to a much greater extent than may have originally been thought. And so if that option has been working due to COVID-19, we provided that option to certain positions and it's been working fine. And then at some point in the future, we return back to the brick and mortar workplace, but an employee requests in that same position who had been working remotely request an accommodation in that form, uh, it may be difficult to argue that it's not reasonable or that it poses an undue hardship if in fact it worked fine for several months during COVID-19. So while I don't think it necessarily sets a precedent, it certainly is something that you all as employers and dealing with accommodation requests in the future and hopefully a future that, that uh, looks much more normal than now, uh, we'll have to consider. And another question regarding teleworking is whether we could require essential employees and public housing to telework or work in isolation during self quarantine and have no symptoms. And what I think this might be asking is, does if an employee is able to telework um, during their quarantine period, are they eligible for leave? And if I'm understanding that correctly, the answer is no, the, the leave eligibility provisions come into play when they're not able to telework. Um, this next question might be more appropriate for for Damon. Yeah, I, think I think this was once for me. This is this 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 uh, squarely presents a potential invasion of privacy. And so I'll read it out loud. Is it appropriate to monitor employees while they work at home with remote access? Well, I guess it depends on what type of remote access we're talking about. The good news here is, based on the way the current question is framed. We're talking about monitoring them while they're at work. So this isn't really an off-duty issue, but are we talking about setting up cameras and putting them in their houses? Uh, I would suggest, you know, depending on what we're talking about monitoring, uh, I think requiring them to check in on a regular basis, to be available for phone calls if you need it, to respond to emails. If we're talking about that type of monitoring, I think that's certainly appropriate. We all realize the difficulty of, of, of monitoring a remote workforce. Many of us were dealing with this well before COVID-19 uh, landed on our shores. Uh, it's hard to, to manage uh, uh, employees from a distance, but you can reasonably require them to, to, to satisfy production goals and achievement goals, and you can reasonably reach out to them during work hours uh, and expect them to communicate with you. But when you start installing cameras into their homes, especially in places other than like where private office where they might work, then we, 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 we run afoul of potential invasion of privacy claims. So the monitoring I would suggest would be by staying in touch with people, either text message, uh, telephone, email, uh, or some type of social media device. Okay, another question we have is, I have a few employees who are over the age of 65. Can I tell them to stay home from work for their own protection? Well, you can certainly suggest to them that they're in, in, in a high risk category, according to the CDC guidelines, that uh, for somebody who, if they were exposed and were get to contract COVID-19, people of, over the age of 65, or are, 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 are believed to be at higher risk for having serious difficulty and perhaps even dying from the co from COVID-19 as opposed to other people. But requiring them to stay home from work, uh, you know, is, is a potentially slippery slope. I'm assuming this is a situation in which these employees want to come into work. Now, if it's a situation in which the employer is, is requiring all of its employees to work from home. For example, um, as in previously in Florida, uh, 
the governor, governor had issued an executive order directing everybody to shelter in place and not go into work, then that's one thing. And we certainly should follow any type of state or local ordinances or executive orders. But simply saying, okay, well, people over the age of 65 can't come into work um, because the employer's afraid that they might get sick um, raises potential uh, age discrimination and potential ADA perceived disability uh, issues that I would suggest employers try to avoid. Uh, so it's not something I think employers should require people to do, uh, but certainly if employees who are over the age of 65, or for that matter, employees who claim that they have any, any type of uh, underlying medical condition that would place them at high risk, uh, it's certainly okay to them to talk to them. And if you believe it's appropriate to encourage them to try to work from home if that's an option. Okay, uh, the, the next question, I, I can grab this one too, Laura, if you want. What guidances slash materials are available specifically for public sector employers during this time? Um, again, from a federal level, uh, both the Department of Labor and the EEOC have issued uh, guidances, materials, uh, FAQs, questions and answers. I'm not aware of any that have been specifically geared towards public sector employees, but the information is nevertheless valuable and available. Uh, also, uh, you should consult your labor and employment law firm. Our firm and other firms, you know, typically put out bulletins and broadcasts and news alerts uh, about about COVID-19 on a regular basis. And, and some of those are, are oriented towards public sector employees. Also on the local level, uh, you can get guidance from your public health departments and on a federal level for the Centers from Disease Control. So there's material out there. It may not, always, may not be totally devoted to public sector employees, but if you call through it, a lot of times they address public sector issues. Laura, you want to take six or do you want me to do that? Yes, sir. I think that the next question is with respect to an employer's obligation to record um, COVID, a COVID-19 illness on an OSHA 300 log. I can answer that question very generally. And if the individual, if, if it's not sufficient, if the individual who um, has that question wants to email us at the email addresses on the screen, our OSHA practice group can uh, provide more specific assistance, but generally speaking, the a COVID-19 illness um, can be a recordable illness if it's if it's traced specifically to the employee's performance of their their work duties. Um, but there are certain criteria that OSHA has laid out that should be met before that requirement is triggered, uh, and I don't recall what those specific criteria are. I think they are on OSHA's website. They all kind of relate to that general premise that it has to be confirmed that the worker was infected as a result of performing their work duties. And if you have more specific questions, our OSHA practice group can, can provide assistance in that regard. The next question, and it looks like it might be our final question, is um, what is an employer's obligation to identify employees who may be sick and who may infect other employees, which is a, a great question. So we, again, can answer this question from a general perspective um, and from the perspective of being obligated to provide our employees with a safe workplace. Your state and local departments of health or other laws or government agencies uh, in your area could have additional requirements that you would want to be mindful of. But generally speaking, we recommend that to the extent possible, and in coordination with your local departments of health or other agencies, you do what you can to identify employees who may have been in close contact as defined by the CDC with a known uh, COVID-19 individual and that you um, notify those employees to the extent possible. You keep the identity of the COVID-19 positive individual, you keep that confidential, but you notify the employees of a suspected uh, exposure and require that they 
either provide evidence of a negative test or um, stay out for the CDC recommended period of time without symptoms before returning to work so that you limit um, and mitigate against the risk of an outbreak at your workplace. Yeah, Lori, there looks like there's a, a last question. I can field it. Uh, can public employers require employees to get vaccinated for COVID once a vaccine is created in order to continue to remain employed? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, with respect to requiring them to get it, you know, it's, you know, get the vaccine or, or, or don't come back to work, you lose your job. That's, how I think, how the question is being framed. Uh, we don't have a vaccine yet, but I think the answer to this has been addressed previously uh, with respect to uh, cases we've seen with respect to hospitals. Hospitals, because of the nature of what they do, have in the past required their employees to take certain types of, of vaccines, including a flu vaccine and a tuberculosis vaccine. And generally speaking, employ, uh, hospital employers have been uh, uh, permitted to do that, except in some circumstances in which somebody challenges the, the vaccination policy uh, on the basis of, of their religious beliefs. Uh, and so it's not a clear answer to this, but certainly if, if you're in an industry such as the hospital industry, and, and there's, there's a real risk of contracting the virus or spreading the virus, I think you would have an, a, a better argument for having a policy requiring